About a third of the building has been blown away. This is a scene from one of the United States' deadliest domestic attacks. As we walked up, I could not believe what was happening. You really couldn't believe your eyes, and you especially couldn't believe that it was actually happening here in Oklahoma City. The bombing in Oklahoma City was an attack on innocent children and defenseless citizens. The attack came without warning, and according to a U.S. government source, told CBS News that it has Middle East terrorism written all over it. But it wasn't some foreign agent that killed 168 adults and children. This was the result of homegrown right-wing extremism. Well, am I, am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? The Oklahoma City bombing happened years before this Charlottesville, Virginia attack. Both assaults are examples of the United States' long-running struggle with right-wing extremism and brutality. Hey fam, I'm Imayan. In part one of our series, we took a look at the rise of right-wing fanaticism in the United States and the government's response to it. Today, I'm standing at a memorial dedicated to the victims of the Oklahoma City bombing to find out what this disaster can teach us about our future. This is Oklahoma. Cowboy country. The birthplace of the legendary Mickey Mantle. And the location of the country's deadliest domestic attack committed by one of its own. Basically, there are four elements that I have to uh, uh, receive information regarding. It's been 24 years since a moving truck filled with explosives parked near a federal building in Oklahoma City, destroying it and devastating a nation. The explosion killed 168 people, including small children, and injured 500 more. The blast was catastrophic. Half of the nine-story federal building collapsed into the street, an estimated 900 people inside. This attack is one type of far-right extremism, which generally falls into two categories. Hate-based, like the neo-Nazis or white nationalists, as we discussed in part one of our series, and anti-government, like the men responsible for the Oklahoma City bombing. These are the names of the survivors of the attack that happened at 9.02 a.m. on April 19, 1995. Dennis Purifoy is one of those survivors, and we're on our way to meet him. So this is where I was sitting. The building, as you can see here, at one time I figured I was 115 feet from the bombing. That's so close to you. Yeah. That is so close. Here's how Purifoy's office looked before the explosion. Look at the date on this photo. It was taken only a few weeks before the disaster. This is what Purifoy's office building looked like after a massive truck bomb blasted off the facade of a building with a daycare center, instantly killing 100 people and trapping dozens more beneath rubble. I saw a, a flash, and I don't know if it was a reflection on the computer screen of the actual explosion, or if it was an electrical spark. Everything went totally dark and I was knocked out of my chair. That seemed to all happen at once. A ceiling tile fell on Purifoy, trapping him. A co-worker helped him escape. He suffered no major injuries, and along with a few colleagues, got to a place where they could get help. In the immediate aftermath of the bombing, there were two searches, one for the missing. This is Elijah, and he's two, and this, this is Aaron, he's five. And one for the assailants. It was several days before I started even paying attention to who the supposed suspects were and, and that kind of thing. I was going to hospitals where coworkers were. I, and then the, after a few days, started going to funerals. 
I have the uh, obits, I think, for all of my coworkers in here. How hard was it to go to all of those funerals? Well, I, I was I, something I, I really wanted to do. I wanted to be at every one. One reason that it was hard is that there were sometimes multiple ones on the same day. The earliest news coverage quickly speculated so-called Middle Eastern terrorism. But the bombers weren't a group of brown people from far off places. They were homegrown, far-right militants motivated by their hatred of the federal government. This is what the bombers actually looked like. I think I was kind of in shock, like most people were. What, what would possess Timothy McVeigh, who was an Army veteran, why would he do such a thing? And this was during a period where the U.S. had seen several violent far-right acts. The bombing attack shares the same date as the Waco siege. And Olympic bomber Eric Rudolph planted an explosive at the Atlanta Games in 1996. The news media failed to link these stories in the same way they so eagerly do with so-called Islamic extremist acts. How much did you know about far-right extremism before Oklahoma City? Really nothing. I hadn't paid attention to it. It hadn't been, been in the news. Before the bombing, I really didn't know the extent of far-right extremism in the country. Once I became aware of it, I tried to let other people know. I talked about it. I talked about it at church. Um, I didn't, I don't know that I was on a crusade, but I, I was definitely interested in more people learning about it and being aware about it. The plot Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols concocted is eerily similar to one that a trio of white men had hoped to execute the day after the 2016 presidential election in Garden City, Kansas. The militiamen, who dubbed themselves the Crusaders, schemed to kill as many Somali refugees as possible by detonating four car bombs outside an apartment complex that also doubled as a mosque. They were planning to blow up this community in Garden City uh, with Timothy McVeigh style truck bombs, situate themselves at the exits to the community with machine guns and shoot anybody who tried to flee. So it was going to be a horrible massacre. This is David Nywert, and the reason he knows so much about what happened in Kansas is because he's been studying far-right extremism in the U.S. since the 1970s. A judge sentenced those three Kansas men to 25 to 30 years in jail. And their plot shows something Nywert says the nation has forgotten. People understood prior to 9-11 that terrorism could take a variety of shapes. After 9-11, the only kind of terrorism that people thought of were essentially Arabs, Muslims. Today we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Bush's focus was on threats coming from overseas. His so-called war on terror didn't address far-right figures like McVeigh, Nichols, or Rudolph. But we're going to smoke them out. Our mission is to battle terrorism and to join with freedom-loving people. This is a long-term battle, war. And while President Bush literally said Islam is peace to make a distinction between religion and acts of terror, the country's focus on Iraq and Afghanistan meant that the far-right threat that so recently had its attention faded from its collective memory. While the United States was focused on Al-Qaeda and Muslims, far-right hate was organizing and energizing. Unfortunately, uh, America, a lot of times, our legislators and even law enforcement to some degree are reactive. Uh, something significant has to happen in order for people to actually do something about the problem. Former Department of Homeland Security analyst Daryl Johnson watched as far-right extremism became a bigger threat to the country, particularly after Donald Trump was elected. 
So typically during Democratic administrations, like Obama administration, Clinton administration, we see a rise of the far right. And then typically during Republican administration, we see just the opposite. But this time, in 2016, we had a Republican administration come into power and the far right has continued to operate at a heightened level, which goes against all the trending that I've seen over the past you know, 30 to 40 years. Johnson and Nywert both believe the president's heated rhetoric has mainstreamed extremist messages. And Nywert says President Trump has soft-pedaled a version of white nationalism and made it more palatable for a wider audience. The people who were committing these crimes were either referencing Trump's name directly, like shouting Trump, 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 as they beat people up or threaten people, or using his um, name to say, you know, well, Trump's going to get you out of here. This problem didn't start with Donald Trump. He took advantage of it, but he definitely fueled it. And it's massively expanded because of his presidency. And yes, we will build the wall. We've already started planning. It will be built. Nywood says there's a thread he's seen connect the philosophy of far-right extremism to its believers. The personality type that is drawn to these movements consistently is what we call right-wing authoritarians. Authoritarian personalities are basically people who want to be told what to do. People who want an authoritarian rule because they feel more safe and secure. This is the role that Trump plays. This isn't the first time that this has happened. The country's history is littered with examples of far-right extremism being overlooked, ignored, and sometimes even being turned into government policy. Think of all the violence associated with Jim Crow. How worried are you that people will forget Oklahoma City, that it'll fade from the memories? I think as time goes on, it will start fading from memory a little bit, but it is, it's still, even to this day, it's the largest domestic terrorism as far as number of casualties in the United States. I, I hope that we remain, for many years to come, the still the largest domestic terrorism incident in our history. We can't anymore just say, it's not my business. I, 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 I can't pay attention to all that. It is our business, and we have to pay attention to it. Right now, the nation is at a place where it's been before in confronting right-wing fanaticism. And it's making some of the same decisions it's made before in governmental policies, and in news coverage. See, the governmental response isn't the only thing contributing to this problem. The news media, they have culpability too. Both Purefoy and I would say, part of the reason people don't see far-right extremism as a threat is because of how the news media has and continues to portray it. I think, I think they should report more in depth. So unless you get, unless the new media provides some background, people really do remain late pretty much ignorant about it. The book that inspired Timothy McVeigh, it's been inciting far-right violence for decades. Timothy McVeigh, he would try to convince people for months and months and months, his circle of friends, he tried to convince them, he tried to get them to read the Turner Diaries and stuff like that. The Turner Diaries is a racist, dystopian novel written by a neo-Nazi leader. The book reached the pinnacle of its popularity in 1995 once a connection to Timothy McVeigh was made. But there's something 1995 didn't have which may have limited its reach. Widespread, high-speed internet. The internet and social media revolutionized how right-wing extremism met, grew, and conspired. And that's really important because not all right-wing extremism is created equal. It can be found in even the most liberal of places. There's people you won't know. You're trained to blend in with your community. Hey fam, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. One of the things that was the most intriguing to me at the Oklahoma City Memorial were the two gates that they have. There's one at 901 symbolizing the city's innocence before the bombing, and then there's a gate symbolizing 903 one minute after the bombing and what happens to Oklahoma City afterward. Be sure to stay tuned for the third and final part of our series and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.